The, uh, what I thought I would do is, uh, as indicated by the title, is go through five or six of the major questions that I think the moon can help us with over time and that are really largely unanswered at the present time. Uh, the moon gives us an opportunity to define the Earth's Hadean eon. Uh, the only evidence we have of what was really going on now in that time is, besides our own logic, it are the very old zircons that have been uh, found in Australia, and mostly in uh, Jack Hills, but also old zircons are present in some other uh, ancient shield areas. Uh, and what the moon can do as we gradually get more and more information on large basin formation and dating those large basins is give us the information of whether uh, the Hadean was a continuous period of, of large impacts occurring in the uh, inner solar system over almost a billion years, or whether it was periodic impacts, and whether then those periods can define what we should be really trying to look for here on Earth, and to define that very early period of the, uh, of the moon. This is just a representation based on grail data of the uh, very large basins on the moon, and you multiply that by what, a factor of five some people do in order to talk about the number of impacts that have occurred on Earth. Uh, the, uh, some of them, like South Pole Aiken, uh, are continental in scale and may well represent uh, in their melt sheets and the uh, fractional crystallization of those melt sheets the uh, uh, differentiation that produced the zircons that I mentioned earlier uh, and indeed provided seeds for the first continents. Uh, that's uh, something to think about, and and one of the and there is a larger basin, the Procolarum Basin, which is not circled here because it's still controversial. Uh, but uh, Procolarum is 3,200 kilometers in diameter, if indeed, as I suspect, it was a uh, one of the very large early basins. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. That just on uh, topography uh, gives you another representation of the uh, distribution of those large basins. Uh, the, uh, this now is the Procolarum Basin. Uh, a number of lines of evidence and uh, uh, logic, I think, are taking us towards uh, that uh, being considered as an extremely large, very early basin, uh, probably occurring about 4.33, 34, uh, billion years ago. It, uh, uh, the uh, examination of the uh, MG suite ages that uh, uh, have, has been done. Uh, some other considerations uh, make me very suspicious that indeed uh, the moon uh, underwent a huge uh, change uh, with the uh, impact of Procolarum. Uh, the uh, South Pole Aiken, again, at pr possibly at about 4.19. Where did I get that age? Well, there's some, uh, there's some uh, ages out of the Apollo 17 rocks. Uh, in that, uh, roughly in that time frame. And it would be, uh, since it is a, a younger basin than Procolarum would be, uh, it approximately 4.2 is, is, I think, a reasonable expectation. We, we need to get to the South Pole Aiken. Uh, our good friend Brad Jolliffe is working in that uh, direction, and, uh, and that, that is a very important date uh, for us to get, as well as more understanding of the rocks that are actually there. Another period of apparent uh, period of impact is the uh, formation of the uh, irregular non mascon basins such as uh, Fecunditatis and possibly Tranquillitatis, although in recent discussions uh, with uh, Paul Spudis, I'm not absolutely sure now that Tranquillitatis is actually an impact basin. We'll have to uh, develop that in a, in a different time. Uh, Serenitatis, Chrysium, and Nectaris uh, form another uh, period of of impacts that we uh, have some information about. And then, of course, the Imbrium impact uh, is uh, not well dated yet, uh, but uh, pr uh, certainly it and uh, Orientale are the youngest basins uh, that formed on the moon. So there, there you see what happened during the Hadean on the moon, and now we have to try to translate that to the Hadean on the Earth. Uh, another question is a record of the history of the outer solar system. I'll be talking about that some tomorrow at, uh, in, this, in the session in the afternoon. Uh, uh, it, but uh, I think the talk is at 4 o'clock. The, uh, 
Uh, there is uh, at the, uh, uh, at the uh, uh, Shorty Crater site, Station 4 at Apollo 17, some anomalous, very low maturity uh, uh, regolith that has uh, come in on top of the uh, orange ash deposit to protect it over three and a half billion years. Uh, but uh, popping out of trying to come tr up with the stratigraphy of those deposits at Shorty Crater, this uh, low maturity material just popped out, including the ash itself. Uh, maturity indices there on the right, that's IS uh, FEO indices of uh, uh, less than 10, where the light mantle that overlies it is uh, up around 80. Uh, so it is very definitely anomalous, and uh, the question is why? My, uh, my guess is, is as I will uh, mention and uh, talk about tomorrow, uh, is that it represents uh, what was going on in the outer solar system, uh, and, uh, and we'll get into that more uh, tomorrow. Uh, distribution of helium-3 resources. Helium-3, as you know, is uh, a uh, potential fuel for use here on Earth uh, for fusion power production. Uh, the distribution of high titanium Mari regolith is known to a first approximation. I'll show that here in a moment. Well, in a moment. And uh, the high latitude concentrations, though, are unknown. Uh, theoretically, helium-3 would be concentrated in the high latitudes. That solar wind-derived uh, uh, helium. Uh, but we just don't know. Uh, better knowledge, though, uh, of that distribution might attract private investment. Uh, in a lunar settlement to uh, extract helium-3 from the regolith. Uh, and uh, that better knowledge might be developed if somebody could uh, come up with a sensor for uh, 23 MeV gamma rays. Because when those, uh, when a uh, helium-3 captures a neutron, which it does, uh, it releases a 23 MeV ga gamma rays. So you could actually map its distribution from orbit if we can get that kind of sensor. Uh, and the byproducts of Helium-3 production on the moon are what really will enable, I think, Mars missions. Uh, and I'm talking about hydrogen, oxygen, uh, water, and the like. Uh, Neil Armstrong, in this picture there on the right, uh, gave us a great sample, uh, 10084 of the regolith. It's the best uh, overall sample that we have from and from the Tranquility Basin, which is an important uh, basin for uh, future helium production. Uh, Neil uh, told me uh, uh, some decades ago that uh, he looked at the rock box that he had put a lot of basalt and, and uh, regolith breccia samples into, beautiful collection uh, on its own, and he said he thought it looked a little bit empty. So he filled it up with this sample. And uh, what has that sample told us? Well, uh, it's titanium-rich uh, uh, basaltic re regolith. Uh, it has probably about 20 parts per billion helium-3. That doesn't sound like much, but the energy content is so high, uh, it becomes extremely valuable. About 100 parts per million helium-4, 150 parts per million he uh, hydrogen, uh, nitrogen at, at 200 parts per million, and carbon, actually, at 250. So all of this being solar wind volatiles that are trapped in the uh, lunar regolith. Uh, now, these numbers are somewhat different than you would see in the literature. Uh, based on analyses of samples uh, that were brought back, and this sample in particular. Uh, but if you look at the regolith breccias and look at what the volatile content of the breccias are, which have been sort of instantaneously sealed, you'll find they're about a factor of two greater than what we actually were able to measure in the regolith. So I suspect agitation has caused uh, many of these volatile, um, about half of these volatiles to disappear. Uh, you have to realize that these samples are, are, are sieved, they're, they're uh, uh, separated uh, in, uh, into smaller and smaller aliquots, and therefore uh, a lot of agitation will result in the loss of these loosely held solar wind volatiles. This is a titanium map from Clementine, and you can see from the arrow of Apollo 11, it landed right in one of the richest titanium areas, bearing areas of the moon. Uh, and titanium, because of its crystal structure, uh, uh, retains helium and hydrogen much more uh, uh, tightly than do other minerals. So that's why titanium becomes sort of a, of a surrogate for the distribution of helium uh, and, and to some degree for its concentration 
Uh, but you also see that our data at the polls is non-existent, and uh, we really need to find out more about that. Uh, the history of the global magnetic field is still uncertain. We know that it had a global magnetic field from the measurements of the magnetic uh, paleo intensities in, the, in a variety of rocks. Uh, the, uh, uh, the paleo orientation, however, of that field and its intensity vari variations over time are not known. Uh, we, however, at Apollo 17, were able to uh, uh, sample, uh, get a sample of impact glass in a small crater, uh, which also has paleo remnant magnetism in it. And uh, Ben Weiss at MIT is now working to, and we know the orientation of that sample from photography, uh, and he's working to try to determine the paleo orientation. That suggests that at the present, uh, that, that, that particular sample can't not have formed more in a, a few tens of thousands of years ago or it would have disappeared from micrometeorite impact. Uh, and that, uh, so it may well be the current lunar magnetic field, the absence of that field is just temporary. And we're, we're trying to figure that out. We have other opportunities uh, to uh, look, that's the, the sample I was just talking about. Uh, Ron Wells uh, uh, determined its orientation and it's being worked on now. Camelot Crater uh, also may have some uh, basalt uh, at about 3.7 billion years age that we can get uh, magnetic orientations on and Ben Weiss is working on that as well uh, because I, it now looks as if those rocks have, at the rim of Camelot are actually wall rocks that have not been overturned and we can reorient them uh, to the horizontal. And the same goes for uh, a uh, contact of uh, melt breaches in the big boulder at station six. Uh, that, uh, if those ages are, in, they're approximately the same, certainly within the limits of error at about 3.9 billion years, uh, but it may well be that will give us a contact that, uh, and we might know the up direction of, the, of that contact uh, when it was formed. Uh, so there's, uh, there's at least three opportunities for paleomagnetism research in the Apollo 17 rocks, which is ongoing. Uh, I've mentioned Procolarum and its potential impact on uh, lunar history. Uh, mantle overturn looks like one of the things that happened. Uh, solidified uh, uh, residual magma ocean, the Ur creep component of the magma ocean, uh, moved into the lower crust and was then exposed to the Imbrium impact for distribution around that region. Uh, the origin of the magne ma magnesium suite parent bodies may well have uh, been a consequence of uh, an impact of the scale of Procolarum, as well as regional variations in the Mari basalt compositions, uh, which are quite re remarkable. Uh, I'm going to move forward here so we can get some questions. One of the samples that looks like it came from the deep mantle, possibly as much as uh, 500 kilometers down is 72415. And the reason we think that, along with 76535, uh, is a, uh, that uh, pressure release uh, during overturn has resulted in these, uh, what we call symplectites uh, forming, uh, pyroxene and chrome uh, uh, spinel. Uh, one way in which you could form that is the uh, decomposition of chrome garnet which is a high pressure uh, gar form of garnet uh, that may have formed uh, deep within the moon. Uh, and the final question I, I think is still wide open in my mind, not in a lot of other minds, is the origin of the moon. Uh, the, uh, I'm a skeptic on the giant impact hypothesis. Uh, I think there's a lot of reasons to be skeptical, uh, but we'll just have to keep working on that particular problem. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them.